Um, as we get things started, I really want to thank today's presenters. Um, first, Cindy Pitab from the EDA, Tom Schumann from the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation, Scott Hathcock from Moonshot at NASIC, and Rush Yelton, who has been involved in multiple projects and is currently the chairman of the Board of Trustees of AZ Advances, which is part of our newest of EDA project. So welcome panelists, it's great to have you with us today. Um, for those of you that are joining, please remember to mute your mics and keep them muted. We love your dogs, we love your children, um, but I'm not sure that you necessarily wanna share that with everyone. So um, we will um, be monitoring the chat and we appreciate your joining us today. With that, I'd like to um, ask each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves. And um, we're going to start off with Cindy. Thank you, Joan. Um, thank you, it's great to be here. My name is Cindy Patak. I am the new Economic Development Representative for the state of Arizona, and I'm with the Economic Development Administration. Uh, I've only really been here since June, but I'm not new to the federal government. Um, I built a, a decade-long career at the Federal Highway Administration, and before that, I did some urban planning for the state of Maryland. So, again, thank you uh, for, for allowing me to be here today. Thanks, Cindy, and we're thrilled to have um, a member of the EDA team resident here in Arizona now. That was something we've been talking about for a long time. Welcome. Tom Schumann. Thank you. I, uh, thanks, Joan. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm Tom Schumann. I'm the Executive Director of the Center for Entrepreneurial Innovation. Uh, been here about five years now and, and truly enjoying uh, the position here. Um, I have been in business incubation for uh, a large number of years. Uh, formerly from Michigan, and in the 80s and 90s, ran a number of business incubators focused on manufacturing sectors and, and the past president of the Michigan Business Incubation Association. So. Um, when I got here six years ago uh, in Arizona and found that this opportunity was available, uh, I jumped on it to get back in the incubation. So glad to be visiting. Terrific. Thank you, Tom. And Scott, you're up. Hey, all right. So my name is Scott Hathcock, President and CEO of Moonshot at NASA. I have uh, been in this role now going on four years uh, this, this October. Uh, previous to that, I spent uh, 20 years of and built a lot of brands, uh, launched a lot of network companies and, and, and shows. And then uh, following that, spent a good four years in technology startups. So, oh, excuse me, happy to join. Thank you. And Russ. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm currently chairman of AZ Advances, as John uh, indicated. Uh, we're currently working on an evergreen fund for the state to uh, support our science companies, our investors, uh, also President Elton and Associates. So we do economic development with municipalities and others. Uh, fortunate to work with EPA on uh, Arizona Advances, NASA, CEI, and a couple other projects uh, that we have going on. So looking forward to this discussion. Discussion. I uh, appreciate everyone being here. Terrific. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, for the panelists, we're all very familiar with the EDA. Um, but for many of you on the call, you may not be as familiar. So I asked Cindy to give us a bit of an overview. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Cindy Patak. I'm the brand new economic development representative for the state of Arizona. And yes, I will be located in Arizona. Um, EDA is ramping up very quickly. We do have a, we do take a regional approach. I'm out of the Seattle region. Um, before COVID, actually, everyone was uh, in Seattle, and uh, many folks actually represented several states. So since COVID hit, and because of the volume of applications, or just because of the impact, we have ramped up very quickly to have one person represent every single state. So I will be making my way over to the Phoenix area toward the end of September, and uh, while we can travel uh, for the rest of the year. I do look forward to hopefully eventually meeting folks in person. Uh, and what I want to do now is just very briefly talk about what our grant program is, what you know, what we're what we're working with right now, and a little bit about what the EDA does. Next slide. Thank you. 
So the Economic Development Administration is a fairly new agency. We were formed in the 60s. We're the only federal agency whose sole mission is actually economic development. We use a bottoms-up approach, a very locally driven, uh, and many of you may already know who we are, but certainly since COVID, a lot of people know who we are. Um, really, our funding focuses on grants to local, state, and tribal governments. We also work with nonprofits uh, and all in areas suffering from economic distress. Um, our focus is on job creation and job retention. We also are really looking at those higher skilled, higher paying jobs. Uh, and permanent private sector jobs, as well as we like to also be a catalyst for, uh, for private investment as well. Um, and again, the focus is really on locally created jobs that help bolster an area's economic competitiveness. Obviously, right now, since COVID, uh, the entire United States is a distressed area, and we can talk a little bit about that further. But um, the CARES Act funding is not the only funding that we have. It's, it's really pretty much the focus right now, though, for everyone. Um, next slide. So again, we do have various investment types. Again, one of the ones you're probably the most familiar right now is that of the CARES Act, when where we're trying to address COVID specifically. We do have different programs, including public works for construction and non-construction uh, jobs, economic adjustment, and we can also provide funding for technical assistance and short-term planning projects as well. Next slide. And again, we award grants to government entities, including Indian tribes, as well as nonprofits. Um, and those really, when we deal with nonprofits, we ask that you're working in cooperation with a political subdivision. And that generally is uh, the state itself, as well as a county, a city, or a town. And we've got a couple of projects right now um, that nonprofits are taking the lead and, and working in conjunction with those entities. I do want to stress, though, that individuals and for profit entities are not eligible. We have had a couple of requests and, and we actually are dealing with a lot of broadband requests and even as a pass through entity, I, I just want to stress that uh, for profit and, and individuals are not eligible for EDA funds and that can be tough sometimes. So I feel it's better to put that out there now because they're really uh, unequivocal about that. Um, next slide. So EDA grants are is a, it's a matching program and pre COVID we did we do have kind of a table you know depending on the level of distress it'll talk about the matching requirements per project um, and it's basically a 50 50 match that would be standard um, but right now again as I mentioned the entire United States is a distressed area so right now the match is really 80 20. That said, in your project proposal, if you're going to come in under the CARES Act for COVID, for example, your project proposal really does need to show the nexus between the disaster itself and your response to it. So just by virtue of you being in the United States doesn't necessarily make you eligible in that 80-20 format if, in fact, you're not trying to solve a problem that was effectively created as a result of the pandemic. Um, Tribes are the exception there. Tribes can uh, do not require a match. The investment for an Indian tribe is 100%. Um, and, and basically what we look at, depending on your project proposal, is we really look at them through the, uh, through the lens of our investment priorities. That said, recovery and resilience does speak to the pandemic we're, uh, we're experiencing right now. Um, we tend to fund all of these different types, uh, critical infrastructure, workforce development and manufacturing, opportunity zones is a big one, uh, and then we also focus on ex exports and FDI. Next slide. So here are the type of construction grants. I won't go through them all, but just to kind of give you an idea of the types of projects that we do fund, they're up there on the screen. And I would say that it's an exhaustive list. ADA is always looking for creative and innovative approaches on how we handle um, projects. And so I just put this up here for inspiration. And, but as I said, these tend to be the ones that we see the most. Um, our grants typically run from $1 million to $3 million. I know in the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, if you've read through that, it does cap at $30 million, which, you know, obviously, 
as every day goes by, it gets more competitive. And so our ability to grant out that kind of sum is, has, has really passed. I mean, if I can be that honest. Um, so the one to three million is, is a range. It, it again, it's, it's not statutory. So, you know, you, you can come in and ask for more. Um, you, it should be well substantiated, but again, based on the competition, this is, this tends to be what's typical at this, at this point in time. Next slide. So again, for construction projects, we do expect significant job creation and job retention. And it's really important that you make the connection for those projects with the identification, training, and placement of those individuals in distressed areas and kind of show what the workforce pipeline is going to be. Um, and so there you have it up on the screen. Uh, it's important to show evidence within the application itself, what the projected economic impacts will be. And especially with current conditions, if your construction or non-construction project is, has really adapt, is to adapt or has had to pivot as a result of COVID-19, it's really important to show that nexus and what the impact will be. Because obviously the entire country is struggling and EDA is really looking uh, to see it return on that investment. And so that data, the supporting data is really important in these applications. And, and so here's how, here's how that could look. Um, I don't know if, do we wanna go back? I don't know if you went back or forward. Can we go back, maybe back one? Okay, there we go. So can we go back maybe one forward? Cause I wanted to show, yeah, forward. There we go, right there. So the, the question always is, how do we do that? And that's not a simple task, and there are many different ways. How do we how do we link job creation to your proposed project? So what I have here up on the screen, important to document the job creation and private investment. How is that done? Who is the beneficiary? Letters from businesses that say, for example, once you find folks that are trained and are employable, you have letters from businesses that says, we will hire these folks. Market-based economic analysis that says your proposal is actually feasible and that it can, and that it is projected to create X number of jobs and, and it can show a return on investment that way. Past performance is also indication. You know, when we did it here, we were able to create this many jobs and this is how we did it there. And this is the same methodology. We're gonna replicate that here. Um, and again, I can't stress enough how important it is in this current economy that, that we do really have that, that to, uh, to back it up. So something that is, you know, we will, if we build it, they will come is not necessarily a strategy that's going to be competitive. We want something that's fleshed out in a little bit more detail that is really responding to your particular situation, not a typical situation, but your, your situation. Next slide. And so here's what we see here, the difference between non-construction projects and construction projects examples. A non-construction project, far less than a million to three million. We're generally seeing 50 to 300,000. Typically studies are what falls into that category, planning or, or feasibility studies, market analyses, things like that. Many of which are a requirement before you move into a construction job, for example, we, we really do want to see that what you're proposing is, is feasible. So non-construction projects, you know, again, here, a lot of, um, lot of interest in broadband systems. So a broadband study or broadband plan would be a requirement. We would fund that. If you are, you know, wanting to develop a manufacturing hub of some kind or something, we want to see some type of market analysis or feasibility study that shows that it could be successful in what you're talking about. Tourism is a big one, whether it's for economic diversification or diversification as a result of, you know, your tourism industry kind of collapsing because of the pandemic. We, we fund all of those studies and strategies. And I can't emphasize enough how important it is to kind of walk through those. You know, plans that we did a year ago have no relevance in today's climate. So it's it's important sometimes to step back to to see do we have to do something differently? Is it do we have a good idea and we just have to adapt a little bit? Do we need to pivot? All of those things um, you can have funded through the EDA. You don't have to have that figured out first. Um, it's something that we can fund first, and then you can move into if it's if if it's called for 
um, a design engineering or construction grant um, following that. Next slide. So the difference between a good project and a good application sometimes is like there's a big separation between the two. So what I'd like to offer is, you know, you guys focus on the good project and and then really read the NOFO to see what the eligibility criteria are and really take a look at that grant application package. When you go into the NOFO itself on grants.gov, you'll see four different packages. And that has to do with the type of application, or the type of project you're going to do, whether it's a planning project, construction, non-construction, because there's different information that's required. Um, and I can help you with that. And so I would really encourage that once you get to that place, it, give me a call. We can talk about what your project is. We can talk about its connection to EDA's investment priorities. And then after you've read through the application package, you can kind of see for yourself, gosh, do I have all the information I need to fill out a good application? In some cases, you do. In some cases, you do, but you didn't really think you had to do all that. And it might be laying around in a bunch of different places. Maybe other folks, you need to bring other people into the table and that they really need to be a part of the discussion. Uh, so it's really important to review that um, so that you really do understand that there's a certain, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a lot of need on those bones of that application, so to speak. And so again, we can talk that through. I would really encourage you to do that. Um, and once you have that project together, make sure you have all the right folks at the table because you know even someone that's gonna construct something once we start to talk about workforce, job creation, and the businesses that are going to be sustained by that, almost by definition, there are a lot of more. There are a lot more players there. Um, so again, I, I would say reach out first to see that you have all of that to some extent, and then let's talk through. Let's talk it through. What I love about EDA is the process is very iterative. You, we can talk a lot before you click submit, um, and I would encourage you to do that. Once you click submit. Um, a whole lot more people get involved and a whole lot more time passes by. And I know folks really do want to see things uh, materialize as quickly as possible. The volume of applications has increased such that, you know, we've gone from one day reviews to almost four day reviews every month. Um, so my, my goal really is to get the strongest application possible before our investment review committee so that they don't have tons of questions. We don't have to go back to you and ask for clarification so that we can keep these things moving. Uh, and so I love to be able to present uh, in, in forums like this so that we can we can establish a relationship, even if it is a little wave on the camera, uh, but it's important. It's important that you feel you can call me about this uh, so that we can get a good project going in the pipeline. Next slide. Um, I do, I do feel I've kind of gone through this, uh, the funding, the 80, 20 match, which is what's common. If you're looking at the United States as a distressed area, if you can't meet that requirement, the match is, is 50, 50. We do have a table in the suggests what the matching requirement would be. Um, again, different application packages based on whether or not you're doing a planning grant construction or non-construction. And I feel that the other thing I wanted to mention is that your project must align with a comprehensive economic development strategy. In the state of Arizona, we have economic development districts. If, if you're not really working with your economic development district, I think it would be important that your project aligns with some type of strategic document so that we understand that you're not working in a vacuum, that it's consistent with an overall strategy of some kind, and, and, and that's something that we would look for. So that said, I guess my last, my last slide up on the screen is really my contact information. Normally I'm just on the telephone, so I slid in a little picture of myself there so you could know. Um, but again, I can't stress enough to reach out to me first and just to brainstorm, if anything. And so there you have it, my, uh, my email address and my phone number I'm very proud of because I only got them both very recently. Um, so again, I look forward to to hearing from you um, so that we can work together as partners to lift up the state of Arizona and move forward beyond this pandemic. Thank you, Cindy. That was terrific. And um, you see that our while you were talking, our audience has grown. So you are a magnet. Um, <laughs> 
So what I'm going to do now is get our get us started on our next part of this presentation. And um, what we have at, are going to do is very quickly give Cindy and the rest of you an overview of what is um, actually done, what happens after the project starts and after the project starts making an impact. And I should be sharing my screen and I'm hoping that you can all see it. Mr. Schumann, take it away. Very good. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, Cindy. A great presentation. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, we can move on to the next slide. That's just kind of introduction. I did want to say EDA funding has been very important to CEI. Um, our, our facility that you kind of see there in the picture was built with $3 million uh, in funding from the EDA as one of the construction grants. Uh, we're currently participating in an EDA regional innovation strategy grant um, it, with GPEC as part of the wearables technology program. And I'm in the process right now of writing for a third EDA grant under the STEM challenge. So um, past, present, and future, you know, EDA has been um, a key partner uh, in, in our success. Here at CEI, we primarily focus on the bioscience and medical device industries. Um, you can move on to the next slide, Joan. Uh, and, and our program, you know, really, these are the key elements of it. It's really um, a structured business program. Um, every client that comes in gets put on a roadmap, and we move them forward from A to Z from when they come in to Z when they graduate out of here. And, and we help them with all kinds of items, big and small, from getting your funding to, you know, how to get an insurance quote or hire the first individual. So a lot of nitty-gritty day-to-day kinds of business coaching goes on. Um, we maintain a, a large uh, database of subject matter experts that we connect with our clients. We always try to anticipate what their next set of needs are going to be. So when they need a subject matter expert, we already have someone on tap that can come in and help them. Um, a big draw here um, is our, our wet lab facilities. We have about $2 million of bioscience equipment available for people to use. Um, our labs are clean and certifiable, so individuals can come in here and design, develop, and commercialize products that eventually will be heading towards FDA approval. Um, networking is, is a large part of it, whether it's inside the facility here, you know, working with peers, um, learning from their trials and errors, to connecting to the broader ecosystem like the Flynn Foundation, entrepreneur groups, and those types of things. And then we spend a lot of our focus on market validation and capital acquisition for our clients. Slide. Um, this is our impact for our, um, our first uh, seven years of operation. Um, our clients, are, the combined sales are now up to 157 million. Um, $92 million of investment capital has been raised with clients, and most of that's coming in one and $2 million increments. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of early seed stage uh, funding that's going on here. But the metric that we're most uh, proud of is the 677 jobs um, that have been created. Um, the original EDA application that we put together, Cindy, uh, projected we would do 140 jobs. So we're pleased to be well above um, what we, we, we promised. So, uh, uh, slide. Um, as I mentioned, we always try to anticipate what our clients are going to need next. And, and when we went through an exercise um, about a year ago, we realized that we need a continued pipeline of skilled um, and talented people. Um, and so we have uh, launched a new initiative called CEI Lab Force. Um, uh, slide. Um, and um, Lab Force will be a, uh, a, a two headed uh, workforce development uh, effort. Part of it will be online. Uh, we're putting up a learning management system that will have over 300 bioscience uh, and life science courses in it when we launch. And it'll also be complemented with an in-person training location um, so we can do the hands-on and technical skill kinds of development that goes on. And then the topics there are clinical skills, quality systems, bioscience lab skills, regulatory compliance, and entrepreneurship are the content areas that we will uh, be delivering. Uh, and slide. 
And we're going to be opening up uh, our second location. Um, this will be in downtown Phoenix, part of the biomedical campus. Um, this is the Wexford Science and Technology Building that will be opening um, in late November. And so it's really designed to do that hands-on training, but we're also mixing it with you know our own brand of innovation and entrepreneurship. So there'll be some co-working stations, uh, uh, co-working areas there, uh, a pitch contest area, um, a marketing research validation lab, and those kinds of activities um, that'll be going on there as well. At the same time, just a couple blocks away, the uh, Gateway Community College will also be opening up a makerspace with all the latest in terms of um, metalworking and uh, lasers and electronic uh, equipment so that we'll be able to support us in the prototyping efforts down there. So a, a lot being done by the community college to kind of build that ecosystem uh, for innovation in the downtown. That's what I have shown. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And uh, what I would like to do is now go from central to north and um, ask Scott to just give us a quick overview of the tremendous expansion that has happened with the EDA projects in, in Flagstaff over the last couple of years. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Happy to. Um, so we are entering our, our, I guess we're in our 20th year right now. As a nonprofit, we're a 501c, uh, 501c3 nonprofit, and um, and the the stories you know come from the sense of the community stakeholders coming together to say, you know what, we need we need an incubator, we need a facility here in Flagstaff. And so, about 2008, or I guess years prior to 2008, but a few years prior to 2008, uh, the conversations with the EDA, the City of Flagstaff, NAU, the ACA, uh, you know, started really taking shape. And it resulted in our first facility um, at the campus called NASA, Northern Arizona Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. So that building was opened. It has um, eight wet labs. Yeah, eight wet labs. And, uh, and, and primarily it was created with the focus of the, these sectors for anything bio, bioengineering, biotech, biomeds, light manufacturing, digital technology, and green. Uh, green type eco-friendly uh, companies. Since then, we've added tourism to the sector focus where the campus is concerned. Um, so that was our first. That was our first, uh, I guess, re re recipient of this. And I and I had absolutely nothing to do with it, so I can't even speak to the paperwork that was involved. Uh, you know, Russ and Yelton can talk more about that piece of it. Uh, but then again, when we, when we fast forward into 2015, 2016, it became clear to the city of Flagstaff and to the leadership at the time that uh, after these people, after these founders were to leave the incubator, there was still no place to go. You know, you still had a lot of legacy landowners or the lease owners in uh, the city that were unwilling to compromise or maybe build out so, you know, whatever was needed from a bio standpoint. And so uh, they went back to the table, went back to the EDA, and uh, the creation of, of those uh, partnerships, as well as the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center for Northern Arizona, all came together and we built another 28,000 square foot facility, uh, which again sits on the uh, campus with the incubator building. So outside of those two projects, uh, Moonshot and Nasit, it's primarily been the recipient of funds that cities and economic development organizations have won from the EDA. And we are uh, a toolkit, I would say, to utilize those funds. So we have done work in the state of Washington, uh, you know, particularly around the uh, coal mine and power plants closing. Uh, we did a lot of work in uh, Washington, yeah, okay. Oregon region, as well as uh, here in Arizona as well. So uh, we are, not, I, I, you know, honestly, we don't do a lot indirect we don't do a lot direct now as far as uh eda funding we're but we are a great partner so if uh if your organization is uh filling out um, for the purposes of getting funding and, and you need some assistance you know we've got a great track record with the eda as far as facilitating and and job creation and doing the types of things that your organization would be aligned with thank you so thank you so much scott and Russ Yelton, you were there towards the very beginning 
why don't you take us kind of through some of the things you've been doing here in Arizona and then tell us about AZ Advances. Oh, you're on mute. Hold on. Try again. There we go. All right, great. Yeah, I was uh, recruited to Flagstaff in 2009. At that point, a 10,000 square foot facility um, really didn't have a program. I uh, had the right partners. We had the university, you had the city, uh, you had the private sector interests. And so we were able to put in a program fairly rapidly. Uh, we actually filled the building in the first 12 months and then was like, hey, what do we do now? Uh, so at that time, we were working uh, with Jacob and Sias out of the Seattle office, uh, you know, doing our report, showing the job creation uh, that we were hitting the plan and hitting the metrics. Uh, but as Scott alluded to, we, we found out very early that even though we had the initial facility, we lacked the infrastructure for what we would refer to as a tier two company, a company ready to move from the incubator, you know, creating the jobs, they've got revenues and such. Um, and we didn't have the commercial property. In fact, one of the first companies uh, we incubated was a life science company. Uh, in 15 months, they created 22 new jobs. They were so cash positive, they actually left the state and moved to another municipality in another state and bought a building. And they were less than two years old. Uh, so at that point, we said, wait a minute, <laughs> we've got the first part of this right. We need that second. Um, we were able to go back to uh, EDA. Uh, at that point, combining it with the emergency center for a $4 million grant. Uh, we received a million dollars from ACA, additional investment from the university, as well as the city, uh, to now have those tier two companies in that space. And that space is something um, that as you're developing your projects, you need to be thinking through not only the phase you need now, but the phase that you're going to need next. Um, we're certainly involved uh, with CEI. Um, you know, Tom and his crew has done a great job there. And um, we're also working on some other projects, uh, broadband, others in uh, northern Arizona with some university as well. Uh, certainly, AZ Advances uh, is one uh, that we've been working on because we've realized that the need for access to capital of our companies within the state has grown tremendously. Our investment groups, uh, ATI, Desert Angels, and others have also grown very well, uh, but we still lack uh, some of that initial or mid-level funding. So the purpose of AZ Advances is to create an evergreen fund uh, so that we will continue to have that lead investment. Uh, certainly this week with the uh, White Hat, uh, which Joan under your leadership has had great success. Uh, thank you for that and bringing companies and investors here. So we're putting the pieces of the puzzle together, but one of the main things I would just really uh, say, and, and Cindy touched on this, is it's all about collaboration. It's all about bringing the right partners together at the right time and being sure you have everybody at the table and you can have some very successful projects. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Russ. And um, thanks for, for mentioning White Hat. So for all of you that are on the call today, um, we have some fantastic programming coming up in the next couple of days, specifically focused on investment. One key part of White Hat, and this is actually being supported now um, with our current EDA seed fund support grant as we're bringing the investors together. Um, but since White Hat started in 2014, and now each every two years, so 32 companies in 14, 16, and 18 each, uh, have gone on to uh, attract and close on over $1.1 billion in funding. So that is the type of collaboration that this community is able to do with all the people that you see on this call uh, working together. Now, as we go into um, just some questions that we discussed with the panel ahead of time, I wanna make sure that those of you that are in the audience have the opportunity to also send in any questions you may have for the panelists. So as we're talking, I will be monitoring the chat and um, hopefully we'll have a chance to get to a couple of those questions. So with that, um, what I'd like to kind of put out to the, the group as a whole, um, and Tom, you know, I know you've been very active in this area, so um, you know, again, keep those answers short so we have time for audience questions, but what are some of the best practices that you've seen in building this entrepreneurial ecosystem? Yeah. Uh one thing that I'd love to point out is um, the practice that we do of creating a, a, a customized roadmap 
for every one of our clients. Many of our clients are coming in um, out of research labs in academia and other research environments and really aren't really familiar with the world of business. And there's so many things that they would miss if they weren't given a roadmap and say, here's how we're going to progress you along as you develop uh, your business over the next two to three years uh, while you're in here. And then combined with that, we, we put in a level of accountability. There's a, a monthly meeting uh, that we meet with clients and we hold their feet to the fire to keep moving along on some of these items that they're not comfortable doing. You know, we have to push them out of their comfort zone sometimes to start working on financial projections or start making sales calls and those types of things. So that roadmap combined with the accountability has been a good practice that we've used here at CEF. Great. And Scott, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, so we've incubated a lot of incubators over the last several years. And I would say the thing to focus on, and uh, Cindy, I think you said this earlier, uh, don't just build it and, soon, and assume they will come. You know, you really have to do a lot of talent um, research. Uh, you have to see what's in your region, the interest, the areas that lie. You know, it's sexy right now to say, hey, I want a digital incubator, you know, to build a technology incubator. Well, that might not be what your region can support, right? So, you know, given the fact that where we live, we're very rural, more rural, and we, we work with a lot of rural cities across Arizona, um, it's about really understanding the talent that exists and, and build that talent, um, recruit that talent, support it with the workforce, and then figure out the building that you need to be building or the facility you need to be inhabiting. Um, just don't just don't use the EDA funds to build a building and then expect everybody to show up the first day and start companies. No, I know. Um when um, CEI was getting started, Russ was counseling its CEO at the time. And the first thing they did was put AZ Bio's office in CEI. So AZ Bio would be the magnet to bring everybody else in. And today there's no room at the end. Tom's full. So I guess that worked. We're going to try and fit a couple of your interns in um, later next year. But yes. Yes. Well, we are. Yes. Um, we AZ Bio believes that you know one of the missing pieces that we have right now is a really well structured statewide initiative to provide um, professional education and entrepreneurial support to the companies. And so um, we too are in the process of applying through the EDA process right now, um, and hopefully we'll have um, a number of fellows and postdocs and researchers and and others. That can help these companies, whether they're at CEI or at NACIT or down in Southern Arizona at Forge. Um, we've got everybody as part of this collaboration. So fingers crossed, we're we're waiting to hear, and, and you'll be the first to know if we did. So when you talk about being successful as an entrepreneur, um what and I want to keep this short, okay, Russ. Your top thing an entrepreneur entrepreneur needs to be successful. I think you need to know what your appropriate role is in the company. One of my favorite questions of entrepreneurs walking in my office is, "When do you have to be replaced as the CEO?" And you look at their face, you look at their reaction, and you, you know, do you really understand the commercialization process? Do you know how to raise money? Do you know what a proper exit looks like? Um, just being sure that you know they're using the best skill sets they have in the best possible way. One of the things I used to hate is one of my requirements was open book accounting. So every quarter, you know, you bring in all your financials and every quarter you look at a balance sheet and you go, that's not possible. You've been in QuickBooks again. So I think helping them understand what they don't know and the value of surrounding themselves uh, with professionals that know how to do that is the top thing. Scott, you want to build on that? Yeah, I would say get them introduced to accounting and legal early. Uh, those are two things that um, typically will throw a company right off the tracks. If they ignore that because they're not good at it or, you know, for whatever reason, uh, just make that part of their daily uh, thought process. Yep. Uh, huh? I would agree that it really is building out your team, whether, you know, initially it's a contract and services for accounting and legal, but eventually it's your first hires. And, and the key thing is to fill out your advisory board. So you're getting a lot of different perspectives of, uh, you know, your product and the market and such that uh, you're not operating inside of a bubble. And then the, the other thing I would add is it's really important for uh, an entrepreneur to understand what their purpose is. Why are, why are they starting this business? You know, because it's going to be trials, it's going to be tribulations, it's a very hard path. And if there's not a deeper purpose than just making money, um, you're not going to you're not going to sustain until you get to your success. 
And Cindy, you know, each of these um, organizations that EVA supports and the federal government works with in partnership to build these ecosystems, what do you see where, what makes them successful? Just keep that in context, I've only been here since the end of However, what I would say makes makes them the most successful is that they do have the key players at the table from the beginning and that all of those diverse needs are met. You know, they're, they're put into the, the, the model right from the beginning. There's like no add ons later uh, that they thought about, but everything is very well integrated right from the beginning so that uh, somebody mentioned. So, you know what the next thing is as soon as you're planning this first thing and then you can anticipate that. And also EDA looks for that as well. You know, what is the next thing you're going to be needing? And are you positioned so that when we fund this particular piece, that you're well positioned so that we can take a look at that next piece as well. Great. Thank Great. you. So, um, guys, on a closing thought, this is your Brad question. Why is your center the center that is best positioned to help entrepreneurs succeed. Tom Schubin, you're up. One minute. One minute. Uh, three things, really. It, it's it's the combination of the facility where they can get the work done that they need to get done here with the specialized labs and such that we have. It's the business counseling. It's that Rolodex of people that they can connect with into the community. Uh, and finally, it's the internal community. Uh, there is a huge value of being in an incubator with other people who are going through the same kinds of problems that you are or having the same successes that you really can support each other and learn a lot from each other that you wouldn't if you're out working as an island somewhere. Great. And Scott, one minute. Okay, so we are agnostic to industry. And but I'd, I'd love to also say that we are um, democratizing entrepreneurship because we are working with folks in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you know, good, so everywhere folks have great ideas and great resources and thoughts about how to build up their community, create jobs. And so we have the ability uh, to do that. So although we have facilities, we are uh, a virtual incubator as well and are really helping to serve the rural parts of uh, the state as well as other states. Right. And what makes AZ advances different? Well, I, I think if you look back at our traditional funds that we've had in the state, uh, the last one you know, had its last drop powder in 2009. So AZ advances is being set up in a way that is sustainable, just like the, we set up NASAT and CEI. You know, we looked at industry best practices. We looked at best models and look at them today. And AZ Advances, we're doing the same thing and uh, excited to see that support those. And if you look at uh, what Tom was saying earlier about you know, doing, looking at what the clients need and its workforce, we've done the same thing here on the capital side. So as we get the fund up and running, um, it's not just write a check today and it's gone, but it's there in perpetuity to support all of these programs across the state. All right. And for those of you that are on the line, I see that we have a number of fundraising CEOs on the line. So I just want to make sure that I'm very clear. We are not allowed to deploy any capital out of AZ advances until we complete our initial three year grant period, which has a, has 18 months to go. So we're working hard to build up that base of capital so that when we can deploy it we're supportive you um but until that time we can never commingle federal funds and funds that go out to an individual company so um help us be successful in the 18, next 18 months and we'll help you be successful forever all right so with that, we're coming up right on the end. And let's see, you know, this one is just like the other one. I don't see any questions in the chat and I'm getting texts on my phone. You guys do not make it easy for me. So the next question that I have on the chat is Southern Arizona. We've talked about Northern Arizona and Central Arizona. Um, we've got a thriving entrepreneurial community in Southern Arizona. How can we best support them in accelerating their growth the way Central and Northern has? Cindy, why don't you kind of, you know, what are some of the things that they should be looking at? 
Cups, sem desamigo. Oh, there you go. Well, I, I feel the best thing to do for anyone is to kind of step, step back and look internally to see what the area may support and then and then how how they can get there. That said, I mentioned our economic development districts. I would right off the bat reach out to the economic development district in southern Arizona and and get and get partners all relevant parties at the table to kind of talk it through. Um, and I, I am an advocate of planning, uh, the planning process, the research and reaching out to folks in the area to see what where the interest is and what the area can support and then start to kind of build the mechanism to, to start to put that together and including the funding component. And I feel that the earlier these folks are brought to the table, the better the synergy that's created and the better the ultimate outcome will be. And then use your resources. I mean, we've got all these folks up on the screen. We were talking about, you know, their own success stories and how could those be replicated um, in Southern Arizona, taking those, you know, the different dynamics uh, into play. But there are certainly some things that, you know, people can learn from uh, with other success. Terrific. And um, I think that that will be, I, Christina's <clears throat> hopping in and said she knows all the players, she'll be happy to help in Southern Arizona. Yeah. So, um, I wanted to um, thank our panelists, um, Tom Schumann from CEI, Scott Hathcock from Moonshot at NACIT, and Russ Shelton from AZ Advances. Um, thank you for joining us today, but more importantly, thank you for the essential services that you are providing to our entrepreneurial communities and cindy welcome to arizona we're very 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 appreciative of all the wonderful support that we get from eda um brian parker i know is it was, was tied up and couldn't join us today but he is a rock star um i he think is. that he has there has never been a time that i have not gone to brian um, that he has not, you know, quickly gotten us answers so that we could be more successful. So a big thank you from all of us in Arizona to the EDA team, to our entrepreneurial thank support you. team, and to you, um, all of the, our um, viewers that um, participated today, we truly appreciate what you're doing because our job is to help you. Your job is to change the world. So with that, we're going to... Um, sign off. Thank you, everyone. Um, for the here in the system, there will be another session at three o'clock today um, with our legislative leaders, where we're going to be talking about what comes next as we come out of this crisis. So um, you're welcome to join us then. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.